one, it is now six o'clock and I would like to call the Rockdale County Board of Education work session to order. Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Second, Janie Jones. Thank you. A motion to approve the agenda has been made by Sandra Jackson Lett and a second by Ms. Jones. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. We will now recognize visitors who would like to address the board. Good evening, Ms. Tina Hobbs. Come forward, please. This is the time when we all allow citizens to three minutes to address the board. Please feel free to submit any documents to the board. We do not normally address your concerns tonight, but we ask the administration to address your concerns and provide you with an appropriate response. If your topic involves a personnel matter or if you contend that your legal rights have been violated, we have specific grievances procedures for the matter. Res respectfully ask that you refrain from making threats, using obscene or profane language, making slanderous remarks, or engaging in behavior that disrupts the decorum of the meeting. I would like to welcome you. Superintendent, uh, my question, I'm really concerned about the students that, that lay out of school, say for 10 days. I would like the document that shows what happens to these children, how the parents are contacted, if they stay out of school, what, what happens after that, and at what time do the courts get involved to get this stopped? Cause, because I know that Judge Snyder, when he was in office, he was very strict about that. And he got the parents, if the kids were not there, the parents were put in jail. Yeah. He was very, very, very tight on that stuff. And I know there's a lot of kids that are not, they're being kicked out of school or disciplined or whatever, but I want to know how that's being handled. Okay. Um, there's some more things that I really want to talk about, but I'm going to do it one thing at a time at each one of your meetings. And I just want to let you know that I'm going to have some more backup when I do come up here, but I'm just really concerned about our schools right now. And one thing I don't understand either, if a child is not at a reading level where they're supposed to be, why are they being passed? That's my main question, because when I went to school, if you couldn't read, you couldn't pass the class, you had to be retained to that year again. And I think that needs to start happening then again in Rockdale County. I've lived here all my life and I expect the board to really look at this stuff and think about the children. Just because one person makes a suggestion doesn't mean you need to agree with it. That's all I got to say. Thank you so much. Ms. Hobbs, I look forward to responding thoroughly to your questions. I appreciate the questions. Thank you. Ms. Turner, come forward, please. Welcome. Good evening, superintendent and board members. My name is Corliss Turner, citizen and taxpayer of Rockdale County. At the much consideration of the superintendent's contract extension, new vehicle and pay increase while having failing students for many years and with uh, no plan to help those students to get to grade level, increasing the school overall performance. This both harms the students in the community. There's uh, plenty of development that are not being sold. One developer has stopped his, stopped this building because the houses, the townhouses aren't selling. And I'm sure that's because of interest rate along with uh, school performance. Teams win with good culture and leadership, and I believe that is what the school system is lacking. With that said, I am putting my full support behind Tina Davis, Larry Cox, and Justin Kenny as our new school board members. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Larry Cox, would you please come forward? Welcome. 
Hello, good evening, everyone. I noticed on today's agenda that there was going to be under board discussion, uh, audit discussion. I would encourage this board to consider that. I would encourage this board to consider voting for an audit. I look forward to hearing your discussion today regarding an audit and how that flows. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ivada Washington. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon or evening, uh, board. I'm Yvetta Washington, and I'm president of the National Council of Negro Women, the Rockdale Newton section. I'm here tonight to make you aware of our scholarships. We offer scholarships to C students, 2.0 to 2.99, um, $500. We give one to each school in Rockdale and Newton counties. Guess what? We have no applicants and we've been open for weeks. We've talked to the counselors and we just haven't gotten any traction. Now we have had A students to apply, but our scholarship is for the C students. So I was wondering if you could give me some ideas as to what we can do to encourage the students. Our process is simple. Um, other than pertinent information, we ask two questions. One question is, why should you be chosen as the 2024 NCNW scholarship recipient? The other, how will receiving the scholarship help your academic journey? Now, uh, students, this year we added, students can do a video and provide this information to us because we were trying to make it more attractive, but we just haven't gotten any traction and we don't have any applications. So I wanted to make you aware. So thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that with us. Okay. And we will be in touch with you okay. and help you get that. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Washington, if yes. I might, if yeah. I might, Madam Chair. Sure. Uh, could you tell us the deadline? Um, Have the, you extended the, that deadline? We we are going to extend the deadline, and it'll probably go to close to the end of the month because we right now it's the seventeenth. So I'll put a new deadline um, in so that we can allow you know additional time. Thank okay. you. Thank you. And I do have, uh, I've shared the um, application with Ms. Ball. Okay. And, uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, all right. Thank you, visitors, for your comments. Someone should be in touch with you soon. The um, Madam Chairwoman, if I might, uh, it, I do notice on one, at least one card, there's not information to, uh, for follow up, such as phone number or email. So I would just say that if you wish to have follow up, uh, please uh, uh, share that information. If not, you uh, you apparently just you wanted to share the information, but just know that that we do have the section clearly indicated on the card to put contact information. Thank you. Okay. Do you I know how to contact you, Miss <laughs> Miss Turner. I, right. right, right. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dr. Oates. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's cabinet updates. Dr. Oates, please introduce your cabinet and provide your update. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, Vice uh, Chairwoman Duncan and our distinguished board members, executive and senior cabinet members, uh, and our uh, guests, our citizens. Uh, we do have several uh, combination action items and or presentations tonight, and we'll begin with our advanced academics department. And uh, so I'll yield to these ladies at this time. Welcome. Good evening, Dr. Oates, Chairwoman Brown, Vice Chairwoman Duncan, and Board of Education. My name is Renata Rowland, and I am the Director of the Department of Assessment and Advanced Academics. This evening, my team and I will share some updates on advanced placement, gifted, GHP, AVID, and testing here in Rockdale County. As you may know, the purpose of the Office of Assessment and Advanced Academics is to provide teachers and administrators with a balanced system of assessments, measure student achievement, manage special programs and advanced academics, and ensure compliance with federal, state, and local guidelines. Today, you will hear key details regarding how we work with RCPS leaders, teachers, and students to remain in compliance with those guidelines. 
This evening, I have two of my team members here. You will hear information regarding our gifted program from Miss Stacy Gillespie to my left, and you will hear information regarding our advanced placement, GHP, and AVID from Miss Beth Gillis to my right. And now I will turn it over to Miss Gillis to share information regarding advanced placement. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having us again. Um, as you know, the Office of Advanced Academics belief stands firm on the fact that equity, exposure, and experience be offered for all RCPS students. Tonight, Ms. Gillespie and I want to highlight the community's return on their investment in the Office of Advanced Academics. Not talking dollars and cents, teachers and students, facilitators and learners. Let's start with advanced placement. One of the things we pride ourselves on in Rockdale County Public Schools is that we're not gatekeepers to AP classes. We believe all students, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, have the opportunity to enroll in AP classes if they wish and have the opportunity to earn college credit if their score is high enough with the university college they, they are trying to attain to. I want to take a minute to look at this list. We have expanded our course offerings over the past three years. We are offering a plethora of courses for our students. This is giving them the equity, the exposure, the experience that they need. Look at what's highlighted in blue, if you will. These are courses that we offered this school year. We are one of the districts across the nation that were able to offer AP African American Studies in our high schools. We also, thanks to the board and cabinet for this, we were able to offer AP Latin and the first to do so in the state of Georgia. So we're paving the way there. I want to take a minute to look at what's in yellow, AP Cybersecurity. The College Board has a new program called Career Kickstart. It aspires to expand the successful AP model to the career and technical education space by offering high schools a new set of career-oriented courses and exams. In conjunction with Dr. Williams at RCA, we wrote a proposal and an application, and we here in Rockdale County Public Schools are able to offer AP cybersecurity next year at RCA. Only 150 high schools were chosen in the state of Georgia, and we have one of those right here in Rockdale County. Let's look at the community's return on their investment. We look at our AP scores. We had a 5% increase on students who scored a 3, 4, 5 and increased our number of students who took the AP test last year. We increased our AP scholars from 83 to 104. We outscored the state mean in seven courses. We outscored the global mean in 11 courses. Looking at that return on our investment, Currently, we have been able to increase our number of students and our number of enrollments in Rockdale County Public Schools this school year. Now, if you notice, I've told you about this before, enrollment sometimes can be a little higher because you could have one student who's in multiple AP courses, as you know. So that's wonderful. Just to kind of give you some data points here, we went in number of students enrolled in 2022-23 from 1,160 to this school year, 1,356. We look at our number of enrollments. We went from 1,678 to 2,043. And let me say this, <laughs> thank you. And I wanna say this about that applause because yes, we're the Office of Advanced Academics, Stacey and myself, but it's not us. It is these teachers, it's the leaders, it's the students in these buildings who say, hey, can we do this? I wanna offer this, what can we do? And we're like, yes, we support you. And then I come to board, I come to cabinet and they're like, yes, yes, whatever we can do. Because we wanna make sure our students are not just competing with other students in Rockdale County, we're competing with every county across the state, across the United States, and we wanna make sure our students are positioned where they can be successful because we talk about this before but it's not if our students are graduating and going to the workforce and military it's when and we've got to make sure we're doing our part here because it's back to the community's return on their investment one of the things that we're excited about is we have had an increase in teachers using the ap classroom platform using that with the daily videos and the progress checks i believe that's where we're seeing that increase in our three fours and fives Again, thank you because College Board is not necessarily a very cheap program that we offer here, but you've invested in it and you're investing in the lives of the students of Rockdale County Public Schools. I want to move on to GHP, another thing that I do. So we have a lot of things that fall under the Governor's Office of Excellence, um, the Senate applications we have, the House of Representatives applications we have, but currently I want to talk about GHP. 
we have had an astronomical increase in interest in the governor's honors program here in Rockdale County to the point that this year we had to start school based applications first and go through a series of interviews there before it even came to the district because I had over 125 last year that we were trying to manage here. So this year we had 65 students who made it out of the school level that came to the district level. From those 65, we had 32 who made it to the semifinalist round at the state. From those 32, we had 10 out of 4,200 students who were named to the semifinalist round. And we have five finalists who are now going to Governor's Honors Program. I just spoke with one today at one of our high schools. He is so excited. He said, this is actually a dream that I had when I was a freshman, when one of the band members went as a junior. And he said, I never thought I'd get to go. He said, I'm I'm so excited. So once again, so our return on investment, we are placing our students in the areas they need to be in in order to be successful. I'm going to turn it over now to Ms. Gillespie. She's going to talk to you a little bit about our gifted programming. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see all of you again. The assessment department supports the testing that's necessary for gifted screening as well as for gifted eligibility. And those are the assessments you see here. COGAD, PSAT, PreACT, and STAR are our screeners and also are used for our eligibility testing in the areas of mental ability and achievement. Our spring testing has begun for this school year, and this process includes five phases. Phase one is it includes the referrals either by individuals or test data. Phase two is when our gifted support teams meet to decide if referred students move forward with gifting. Phase three involves notifications to parents and obtaining consent to evaluate those students. Once those are received, testing can begin. Phase four requires reviewing the scores and determining eligibility. And then phase five concludes the process with parent notification, obtaining consent to serves, and then deciding on those delivery models for those students. Our March 28th program challenge, the elementary edition, <laughs> held our second annual project based learning showcase and we were honored to have Ms. Jones and Mr. Kenny in attendance. Uh, the students presented their projects with so much enthusiasm and the parents enjoyed seeing not only their students present their projects, but also what elementary students across the district were learning and presenting as well. Today, our gifted students make up 11.1% of our entire student population. This is higher than the state recommended average of 10%. And additionally, our gifted numbers have increased at all grade bands. In the fall semester of this year, 86 of 225 students were found gifted eligible. We currently have close to 300 students in the assessment process this spring semester. At the secondary level, referrals are in, GST meetings have begun, and the universal screener is being administered. As for acceleration in our district, during the fall semester, three students participated in our acceleration process and successfully skipped a grade with the use of the IU acceleration scale. And once this happens, we follow up with them six weeks later to check on their progress, and we'll be checking in with them at, by the end of this year as well to make sure they all are well. And yes. It's a tool called the Iowa Acceleration Scale. Yes, ma'am. The IAS. And we currently have four more students in the process right now. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Gillespie. Um, that slide that she said actually said three, but she's right, it's four, because we got a call today from a middle school that says, hey, we have a parent who wants to request this. So the numbers keep increasing. Speaking of numbers increasing, let's look at some gifted data here. I told you we're going to talk about return on investment, but it's also helped us in a monetary way as well. What you allowed me and Ms. Gillespie to do a year and a half ago when we came to you with what our desire was for our advanced academics and our gifted population, we asked if we could offer a daytime cohort for our teachers because we thought that would help with our retention. Very graciously, you agreed to it, cabinet agreed to it. We were able to move forward with that. Because of that, we have more teachers who are gifted certified who are teaching our students, not just gifted students, it is helping all students with differentiation. But because of that, we also see a return on our FTE funding. If you take note up here from March 2022 to March 2024, we have an increase of over $636,000. You look at October 22 to October 2023, an increase of $322,000. So yes, that's monetary and that's great, but I can't tell you what you're doing for the students in the classroom. I just want to read to you one quote, and I know I, I could take all the time in the world to brag on our teachers and our students, and I don't have that time. I realize that, but I want to read you one quote. 
This teacher said this heightened awareness of different student characteristics through this course has allowed me to adapt my teaching approach, tailoring it to the diverse needs of all my students. In essence, this gifted endorsement class has not only brought in my perspective, but has also enriched my teaching methods, ultimately benefiting all my students. And that's what we believe in. It's for all students. Lastly, let me talk about AVID and highlight that real quick. AVID stands for Advancement via Individual Determination. We currently have two elementary schools, two middle schools, and three high schools who are AVID. Heritage, as you know, came on this year, as I mentioned in the fall. We have a school-wide approach at the elementary level. At the secondary level, it's a school-wide approach for your Wicker strategies, such as writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading, which is just good tier one instruction. But then also at the secondary level and middle and high, students are selected to be in the AVID elective program. AVID believes in four domains, instruction, systems, leadership, and culture. What is so wonderful about AVID is that it directly correlates to what we ask our administrators to do in schools. They have to write their school improvement plans, their CNA, Title I plans, and that directly correlates with AVID. Some of the things we've been doing this year in AVID, we went to AVID Summer Institute in June. We took about 42 people to that um, in June in Orlando. I've offered AVID professional development sessions in July, September, and October for not just AVID teachers, but also teachers of the general education population as well came to that. And our AVID team members at the schools attended AVID showcases at various districts in the state of Georgia in the fall and in the spring. So that's one thing that we believe in with AVID too. It's continuous professional development. Again, it's the return on the community's investment. We're investing in students. We're investing in teachers. A couple of highlights I have for AVID real quick, and I please encourage you to please go to these schools, see what they're doing. I don't have all night like I wish I did to tell you everything, but Salem just recently went to Georgia State in February. They're going to Kennesaw State in March. Heritage is going to Georgia Gwinnett College on April 19th. Heritage just did a community service project with Hightower Trail, who is not an AVID elementary school, but some of the students there said, what is this AVID thing? Um, so that's just gaining awareness there. Rockdale County High School had a college showcase they did in their auditorium. The students themselves at Rockdale in the AVID program went out and researched colleges, wrote to the different colleges and missions boards, got all types of paraphernalia swag, brought it back to their school, and did a college showcase for 9th, 10th, and 11th graders at Rockdale County High School. So it's just some of the ways that we're highlighting not if but when. Our students are going to college, they are going to career, they are going to military, they are going to the workforce. How are we going to prepare them? The next steps we're doing, we have a lot going on toward the end of the year. I have AP exams coming up in May. We'll be offering the Elite Academy again in June. We'll probably be sending at least 15 to 20 teachers to Advanced Placement Summer Institute to get professional development for all the courses that we offer. We're continuing um, our gifted process right now that we're going through, getting our spring referrals done. We'll be um, making sure that we're continually promoting RCPS students and all things with the Governor's Office of Student Achievement. We are wrapping up AVID CCIs and their certification processes, and we will be attending AVID Summer Institute again this June with various team members from schools around here. I know that's a lot. I just want to thank you because we have a lot to say, a lot to highlight. And once again, let me add, it's not me and Ms. Gillespie, Ms. Rowland, all of us academics, it's the schools, the leaders, the students, what they're doing that makes it possible for us to just come and highlight some of the great things here in RCPS. I'm going to turn it over now to Ms. Rowland. Thank you, Beth and Stacy, for that wealth of information. Now I'm going to share some information regarding Georgia milestones as we pre prepare for our spring administration. Students have been in school the whole school year working with teachers on standards and concepts. As we come to the end of the school year, we are now asking ourselves, how will we know if each student has learned? When Dr. Oates came on board, he structured a balanced assessment system for RCPS to ensure that our students were learning. A balanced system of assessments include formative assessments created at the local level and summative assessments created at the state level. Throughout the school year, my department works closely with the curriculum department to create and administer assessments to students. These assessments provide valuable data for our schools to determine how well, uh, how well our students are doing with the information they're being taught by our teachers. At the end of the school year, our students take the milestones to determine how well they learned and retained that information. As I mentioned in previous slides, the milestones provide information on how well each student has mastered their appropriate grade level content standards in four categories, English, math, science, and social studies. 
The milestones are not just for our school buildings. Not only do milestones provide information to parents, educators, and the public, they also serve as a measurement of the quality of instructional, educational instructional opportunities our students have access to. And lastly, it serves as the key component to the Georgia Department of Education's accountability system. As you can see on the slide before you, our elementary school students test in grades three through five. Grades three through four, they take ELA and math, and fifth up uh, grade five, they take ELA, math, and science. Our middle school students test in grades six through eight. Grades six and seven take ELA and math, and grades eight take students in grades eight take ELA, math, science, and social studies. Our high school students test once they have completed one or more of the following courses: American literature. American Literature and Composition, Algebra, Concepts and Connections, Biology, and U.S. History. This year, we do not anticipate any flexibility waivers. What that means is all the students in Rockdale County Public Schools in grades 3 through 11 that receive instruction related to a milestone course, they are required to test. There is no opt-out option for students. The Georgia Department of Education does not allow an opt-out option. All schools and the, all schools and the school district as a whole are required by the Georgia Department of Education to have a 95% participation rate in the milestones. We met this goal last year and have begun to strate strategically plan to work toward reaching this goal for this school year as well. There are a few specific requirements related to the EOC students that I want to bring to your attention. A student's final grade in an EOC course will be term determined by using a combination of the student's grade in the course as well as the EOC uh, test that they take. One change that happened this year that the Georgia Department of Education passed down to us is that students that take an EOC during the 2023-2024 school year, their EOC shall count for 10% of their final numeric grade. In the past, it's been 20%, but the Georgia Department of Education has shifted that, and so now it's, uh, it represents 10% of that student's final grade. What has remained consistent is that students must earn a 70 or higher as the final course grade to pass the course and earn course credit. As we continue to prepare Rockdale County Public Schools for the spring administration, there are some things that we're strategically do to make, doing to make sure that we're prepared. For example, all of our leaders, assistant principals and principals, as well as cabinet and the chiefs, all were trained during our IST meeting on March 13th. Additionally, there were four testing coordinator trainings, one in February, two in March, and two in April for our testing coordinators to make sure that their, our buildings are fully equipped to administer these assessments so that they produce reliable and valid data. In addition to that, we're not just tra uh, training our leaders, our principals, and our assistant principals. We're training all of our staff in our buildings because we want to make sure that we're creating an environment that's conducive for our students to do well. Each school, is also, each school is also required to have a written plan to address any emergency that should arise to make sure that our students are testing in a safe and secure environment. We're also doing things to prepare our students. We have three district level practice sessions with one coming up on April 17th. Each practice session provides the opportunities for students to use the tool in the DRC platform, which is the platform they will eventually take the milestones in. Additionally, these practice sessions allow our technology department to inspect the network to ensure we have the appropriate capacity in order to make sure that our students are able to test without any issues or in, uh, problems with the internet. Specific plans have been created to ensure that our virtual students are also able to test safely and securely. And then lastly, we want to make sure that our students with accommodations can practice using their documented accommodations um, in order to make sure that they do well in their assessments. It's extremely important for our students to have this experience with the DRC platform, even if they tested in the past, because the Department of Education has changed some things within the platform. So on the screen in front of you, you guys can see a version on the left hand side of what they've seen in the past when they've tested. And then you will now see on the right hand side the enhanced student experience, which is the new what they'll see, the new screen that they'll see when they test. And so I have a few slides.
that you can see. Um, this slide identifies the different accessibility tools and features that students now have access to that have been enhanced for students to be able to use while they're testing. Additionally, they have a visual um, sign language uh, interpreter for those students that do have issues and they're able to use the VSL feature to be able to communicate with the screen. This is our Georgia Milestone Spring Administration schedule. And so we have two weeks beginning on April 29th where our tests will be administered in our buildings. And then we also have a makeup period. The last thing I'll discuss um, is the score notification. As our students test, their scores are populated within the DRC platform and all scores are housed within that particular platform until the students are completely finished testing. Once the students are done testing, the Georgia Department of Education, they verify that those scores are valuable, valid and reliable, and then they approve the scores. While the, D the DOE is working through approving those scores, those scores are embargoed until they're officially released. There is no official release date. We wait for the Georgia Department of Education to let us know that the embargo has been lifted and then we're able to share that information. And so that is all I have to share with you guys regarding the Georgia milestones. I do have one action item I want to present before you all, and then we will stand um, before you for questions. And so with the action item, we have a recommendation the superintendent will Board of Education approved the renewal of the SchoolNet platform and the assessment bank in the amount of $122,263.80 to provide formative assessments to Rockdale County Public School students. This renewal is contingent upon the approval of the contract by the superintendent and general counsel. What's the rationale for this? The district's 10-year access to the platform ended in June of 2022. Each year, we need to renew the contract in order to have access to the platform and the assessment bank, which holds the items that we use in order to assess our students to make sure that they're learning or if we need to go back and revisit some of the things that they may not have grasped. Um, and so that's what we use the platform for. And so it's like a, a computer uh, program that we use that has assessment items and then we push out items. Uh, we work with the curriculum department in order to push out items to the schools. The financial impact, as I stated before, is $122,263.80 that will come from general funds. And so that is all we have for you guys right now from the Department of Assessment and Advanced Academics. And so I will stop talking and stand before you guys with any questions that you may have. Do we have any questions? Board members. OK, go ahead. My notes real quick. The children that are taking the Iowa test in and being um, push um, grade forward, skip a grade, we benefited from the program. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that we're doing that for students. But how are we addressing um, the social emotional part of um, kids that are, they're academically sound, but are they mature enough to actually go to the next grade level and, um, and be able to interact um, in a positive way with their peers? I'm glad you asked that. So the Iowa Acceleration Scale actually has 10 sections. OK. And each section addresses something different. And there's a whole section that addresses that with questions, and they're kind of evaluated. We have a team, a full care team, that completes that assessment that includes their parents. Um, and one of the questions is, how does the child feel about acceleration? Um, they're also evaluated from their teachers about their social emotional um, standpoint as far as how they get along with other students that's all included in that scale so those grades those scores they get determine that and they get uh, the score they get falls within a range and there are four ranges that go from not a good candidate for acceleration to a great candidate for acceleration and there's two more levels in between they may be a great candidate for maybe single subject and not whole grade um, or they just may be a good candidate so all of that is in that scale which is why we adopted that scale because it takes that into account but um a part of Bethany, if you could step to the mic for our viewing audience. Sorry, um, something I'd like to add to what Ms. Gillespie stated. That's one reason why we cho chose IAS. Then what we do here in RCPS that exceeds that protocol 
is that we meet with them, like she stated initially, to say, yes, we're going to accelerate you or no, we're not, based on the evidence we have. We go back and meet six weeks later. We're going to meet back with these same students um, at the end of this year to just see how they're doing. Mainly, that's what we're doing. Um, at these meetings we have, it's me, Ms. Gillespie, and once they have accelerated, it's their current teachers, it's an administrator, it's also a counselor. Yeah, what in the initial meeting, yeah. And one of the things that came out, because I'm glad you asked that, there was one student that we were like, you know, we think it's gonna be great for him. But we just hope he's able to embrace it. It was a big move in middle school. And the teachers came back and said, he has joined math club, he's joined science club, like he's kind of found his niche. And his parents said that was one of the good things for him. So I agree, acceleration might not be for every student. We do look at that um, when we look at the IAS, but I think what also helps benefit our students are these continual meetings that we have, just to make sure that it's in the best interest of the student you've said everything i wanted to hear that there is a continuity mm -hmm. too not just the academic portion of it i do have a, nobody else i do have a few more okay yeah, go um the referral process for when students um are being put into the gifted program what does that look like can you expound on that please yes yeah, so they can be referred either through what we call mass screening so we administer the cogat in the fall and based on those scores, we can determine, hey, this child may be a great candidate based on their scores. And the PC or the program challenge teachers will pull them for further testing. They automatically go on the referral list. The other way they can get referred is by an individual. It can be their teacher. It can be their parent. It can be a special teacher. It can also be themselves. They can say, hey, and I had one at CJ. <laughs> so she said, I see the people that go to Gifted. I think I can go with them. I said, okay. <laughs> so she was able to refer herself and she went through the process. So those are the two main ways that referral happens for the students. And I'm glad to hear that because a part of our mission statement in Rockdale County is to make sure that we empower our, our students to make sure they can speak up for themselves. Yeah. So good. And the last part of my question is we are short on, um, we have issues with teachers. Um, you know, staff in that's just worldwide. Yes. How are we making sure that the teachers that are um, teaching our gifted students are certified or qualified to um, in gifted education? Well, our program challenge teachers uh, all have to have gifted certification be before they can become a part of that program, but that's also where our gifted endorsement has come into play as well. Um, the more teachers we have that go through that process and get their, their endorsement, they're able to then reach more children in that area. For those teachers that are teaching our gifted children that do not have gifted endorsement, they're required to collaborate with a gifted endorsed teacher on the staff. And how much they collaborate determines how many students they actually have in their in their class that are gifted eligible. No. Right. So she's referring to like those the the program challenge teacher at the elementary school does. To expand upon that, um, me and Ms. Gillespie, one of the reasons why we see this FT increase is because of, like she said, the gift and endorsement, but also Ms. Gillespie and I sat down with um, 10 out of 11 elementary school principals, sat down with them and looked at their master schedule and said, what's number one, what's in the best interest of kids? And number number two, let's make sure our service model gives us our biggest bang for our buck with FTE funding. But kid, but kids come first, and so that's what we did. We sat down with ten of them, and we're able to do that to ensure that the gifted student or the high achiever was being taught on a general ed, regular ed, the teacher of record and infinite campus certified teacher. Um, at the secondary level, that's the same model we follow with middle school. Let's talk about high school. For high school, um, we have we have two sections. If you're an infinite campus, you'll have a dot two section for gifted and then a regular ed session for your high achievers. Those teachers now that teach AP, we have a process they have to go through. You either have to be in my daytime gift endorsement class or you have to complete a 10 hour clock course with me. So let me say I could probably fill up several cohorts of secondary gifted um, teachers, but we don't have that that resource at the moment. But so what we offer is on those professional learning days is they take a class with me and and it's a gifted characteristics identification course differentiation in order to teach that AP class, as well as they have to have that AP certification by College Board. Tremendous. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I just have a quick question about SchoolNet. Uh, oh, excuse me. We have 
um, Ms. Jones was asking a question and then we can come to you. Was that okay? Yes. Sir. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Jones. Thank you, Justin. I was just wanted to say attending the showcase, I witnessed project-based learning at its best, right? So it's not, it wasn't just about the projects. It was about the, the skills from collaborating with their peers. I was in awe, not only at the projects, but listening to the students articulate why they created um, those projects um, the way that they did. Now, I did have a question about SchoolNet. I wanted to ask um, uh, what assessments are administered through um, SchoolNet? Our formative assessments at the um, district level are created and pushed out through SchoolNet. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, the schools create CUAs and CFAs at the school-based level. Mm -hmm. And so we have things that we push out that are secured, that are similar to the way that we administer the milestones, yeah. that we push them out through a secured way. Mm -hmm. But then at the local level, at the school building, they have access where they can do CUAs and CFAs, and that's where some of our remediation happens and things like that. So we have access at the district level, but it's a little bit different than what the schools do. But both the schools and the district level, they have access to use as many, create as many assessments as they would like. Okay. And then we have a, for the assessment bank, we have one bank for the district office th to use that secure, mm -hmm. that we can mm -hmm. use questions that we push out. And then the schools have access to questions because they may not necessarily be as strong in creating questions. And so they have something as a resource to be able to quest uh, use questions to assess their students. And, and the overall goal is to, with the school net, is it gives the students practice mm -hmm. with, um, um, being accosted with questions that are almost formulated similar to that of the milestones. Is that correct? Well, it has several um, different uh, resources within SchoolNet. So mm -hmm. yes, that's one of the things that it does. But in addition to that, it has um, a lot of data magic. Okay. And so we can use a, we can cut it up for like subgroups. Mm -hmm. um, you can, there's so much, there's a wealth of data. If you ever look at just even the main page, it gives you a lot of information. And so it gives you information as just the teacher in the classroom about your students and it tracks, you can track like one particular standard mm -hmm. and how they did in January versus how they did in March with a question that is similar but not the same but as an administrator you can track a whole grade level mm -hmm. so it's just different magic that you can do within the platform um, for them to be able to try to make predictions about instruction and remediation for the students yes I love school net <laughs> I am a fan yes I'm, I, and I've utilized it for just what you're saying okay. um, to look at differentiation and to look at um, um, providing PLs where, the, where teachers may need additional support with instructions. So thank you. Yeah, and Adele, I can remember a conversation that I had with um, the middle school principals and they actually tied um, SchoolNet in with um, their star data and the milestones from the fifth graders that came into their sixth graders to make some decisions before the kids actually got on campus because they had access to that data. And so they used those three data points in addition to some other things to make some decisions about the students that they were receiving. It is, yes. Yes, sir. Mr. Kenny? I have no need to ask a question. Ms. Danny <laughs> took mine out of my mind. Oh, she took your question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. No other questions? Pam, I just had a, you got one? Not a okay. question, but I just want to say thank you, ladies, for what you're doing because, you know, we see and we talk about and everybody hears about the kids who might be behind, mm -hmm. following the gaps. We're doing the safety nets, but it's just as important to push these kids who are gifted mm -hmm. and I love what y'all are doing. Y'all have passion about what you're doing. You can tell that you have passion <laughs> about it. Um, I am an old, old governor's honors attendee and that is like high importance to me. And the more that our kids just like the testimony from that one child, the more they see these other kids go and the more they're going to want to go, the more they're going to be involved. So I appreciate what you're doing um, and all that y'all are doing. So thank you. And one thing I want to note um, that the gifted or well, the advanced academics, it doesn't just apply to those students that are quote unquote gifted, but like, for example, AVID approaches those students that are kind of like our middle of the road that kind of need a little bit of extra support to push them as well. And so we try to from the beginning to the end, we want everyone. We right. want everyone. To, we want to help as many as we can. Well, I know we have a lot of students that are potentially first generation college kids. Yes, and, and that's how it is so important for that. So yes, you. yes. Woo -hoo. All right. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Madam Chairwoman, I'd like to just thank these ladies for the tremendous work they do. It's one thing if you when you hear me at various forums sharing the continuous improvement achievement data. It's another thing to be able to dig in and this is where you're being able to dig in and see and hear where this is coming from and all of the different intersecting data points that substantiate that data that I'm proud to share at, 
at, uh, you know, the chamber, at Rotary, at Kiwanis, uh, you know, uh, in the advisory forums. So this is very important for us to understand and, and to acknowledge the tremendous improvement that's being made. We, you, There's always plenty of work to do, and that's these ladies stay busy, constantly focused on that, being focused on that work. But it's critically important for us to acknowledge when we are meeting and exceeding our strategic priorities and strategic plan goals. And remember, there's nothing that they've shared that's not for which there's not a connection to our district's five-year strategic plan. And in the case of what they shared, it would be in the student learning growth and achievement uh, goal area if you wish to go to our website and take a look at our strategic plan uh, that's currently in place. Madam Chairwoman, up next I have asked our interim chief financial officer and our director of human resources to share some information with our board on ESS, which is a resource that has the ability to take care of the staffing for classified, specific classified positions. And let me just share that several years ago, I, uh, I HR shared this information with the board uh, in terms of focused on paraprofessionals. And let me also explain why this is, this is something that I want. This is an informational presentation. So uh, if there are questions, I want to have, this is, I'm beginning a dialogue with the board by this informational presentation. Any questions that you have, if you'll note those and get those to me, I will get those to the vendor and then I'll relay that information back to you. But one of the things as we're in the budget season as well, our finance initial finance committee meeting will be next week uh, at 5 p.m. prior to the seven o'clock regular board meeting. But one of the things that's impacting the budget is the increased insurance costs for classified employees. And that that is a underlying reason why I want to circle back to revisit the ESS resource. So I would ask you, I, I would ask to, 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 um, kind of um, re reserve any reflexive response to this without being informed as to what this about this is about, but also understand uh, as we encounter our budget, everything has to be on the table to make sure that we come up with a responsible balanced budget that prioritizes our students. You can come on to the to the podium. But again, this is something we presented about four, four and a half years ago. There, there was no consensus on the board at that time for this, and I respect that. That's the process. That's the way this works. And so we moved on, but I think it's very timely for us to revisit this because since that time, there are even more school districts that are leveraging ESS for specific uh, and in some cases multiple classified employee categories, ladies. If I may interrupt before you start, just for clarity's sake, this is not a proposed action item. No, it's not an Absolutely. action item, not an action item. And that's an important point, Justin, I appreciate you sharing. This is an informational presentation. Uh, we would have many other steps before we would get to an action item. This is the beginning of a conversation that I will continue with the board to see if we have consensus for how this might be beneficial or not for Rockdale County Public Schools. Well, good evening, Madam Chair Brown, Vice Chair Duncan, board members and Superintendent Oates. As Dr. Oates mentioned, I'm Michelle Stevens, Director of Human Resources. And I'm Interim Chief Financial Officer, Joycelyn Smith. So tonight we're bringing you some information that we hope could benefit us during the budget process. And I'm gonna start with a little background information. Okay, so personnel is currently 88% of our budget. And as Dr. Rose mentioned, the rising health care costs have had a heavy financial burden on school districts. So one solution we were looking at is contracting personnel, specifically paraprofessionals, through an outside staffing company. We looked at the two most um, prominent ones in Georgia, which are ESS, Educational Staffing Solutions, and Kelly Staffing. Kelly's um, focus is primarily on substitute teachers. And so that's why tonight we're talking about ESS, Educational Staffing Services. Currently, we have 311 pairs. Um, 189 of those utilize health benefits through the school district, health insurance, so that's 61% of them. If we were to go with this option that we're gonna talk a little bit more about, the, we would use the new pairs would be hired through the outside staffing agency and any existing pair professionals could opt in. It would not be required for those who are already working with us. So about ESS, they are um, based in Knoxville, Tennessee. And you can see on this map here, the dark blue areas, they are serving over a thousand school districts in the US. They have regional leadership offices. The regional one for us is in Athens. 
And if we were to utilize them, there would be a, a in-district person housed with us to help with um, staffing on a daily basis. These are the 60 districts that they're already partnered with. I think they're actually up to 66 now and 27 or well, 23, I'm sorry, of those are doing the paraprofessional program that we are interested in. Um, Douglas and Oconee are the, the ones that are utilizing just ESS, just the para program, not the substitutes because they do that as well. Henry has recently started using ESS for substitutes. And so in talking with the other districts, some of the other districts that are using it, they have just had a really positive impact on staffing for their system. They've discussed how it was very easy to work with ESS and kind of seamless because we want the employees to still feel like they are our employees, but we're just looking for a way to save money on our employees. So some of the advantages for the employees in working with ESS, um, they would get paid weekly. So one thing that we've seen when we've um, surveyed our staff, one thing they're looking for is to be paid weekly. Of course, we pay once a month now, but not only would they be paid weekly, they would get us slightly more per hour. And then there are different attendance bonuses. So with ESS, you're really paid for the days you worked. And you'll see on Ms. Smith's slides that they don't get paid time off, but we hold back every day that they work. There's a $15 inc like increment that we are pushing or holding for them towards the summer. So that way they'll get paid over the summer. But if they don't work that day, we don't pay them either. So that is another way we're saving money. They have district and regional specific contests. And then you can see on the left side, there's a referral fee. So if anybody refers an employee to ESS, then that somebody gets a $100, a $100, but you all know what I mean. And then benefits, they would still be able to do health, vision, dental, life insurance, et cetera, through ESS. Where you see it says communication live support from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., that is for the employee. So if they're sick that day, they need a sub, they call the ESS live support. Um, it could be that they have a question about their paycheck, et cetera. They would call that live support person. And then under understanding, ongoing training, development and recognition, if we see a pattern of things that they're struggling with that the pairs, like our pairs as a whole or the group of pairs that are hired through, if it was ESS, then they would provide training for those for those individuals. So that's kind of on an as needed basis. OK, so on this slide, we're talking about um, how their pay would look. Sorry, how their pay would look with Rockdale as opposed to how they would look in with ESS. So we're looking at a entry level paraprofessional with zero to two years, and that paraprofessional would make two twenty thousand six hundred and sixty dollars and eighty cents. Both would pay the same. The basic differences is how we pay. We pay over 12 months, so they'll see a lot smaller about amount because it's paid over 12 months, but that gives them that summer pay um, for that time frame. Um, of course, we do we do pay them for uh, 10 days of sick leave. They won't have that same benefit with ESS, but again, they get paid $20,660, um, but they're getting paid for the days that they work during the time that they work. So they would be paid from August to May. Um, so they'll see more in their pay during that time. And in addition to that, like Ms. Stevens said, they'll get $15 a day as a perfect attendance incentive that um, incentivizes them to come every day. So that means, you know, less uh, absenteeism for us. Um, so hopefully, and with that, they would get an additional $2,775 added to their pay for a total of 23435 compared to what we would be paying the $19,421. Um, this next slide basically is the same example is just with a more experienced paraprofessional making $24,670, um, again, they would have that pay spread over the 12 years with us. The difference was they would be getting um, weekly paychecks with ESS and they would have no pay, pay time off, but they get that $15 each day that they show up. And if they didn't have perfect attendance, they would still get the $15 over the summer. It would just be less money. And they get that $15 a day. They save it for the summer. They get four payments, um, the 1st of June, the middle of June, the 1st of July, the 1st of August, and they continue their benefits over the summer as well. 
So this is just an example of the benefit summary. This is a health insurance plan. It says health insurance plan weekly rates. So this is like health wellness and limited medical plan. So as it was described to me, kind of like for a healthier person, it's not the full comprehensive plan that you think about like an HMO, but depending on the individual, they have um, benefits counselors they can meet with upon hire. And if they need something more comprehensive than this kind of basic plan, they can sign up. But those three areas are just um, basic, standard, and preferred under medical insurance. So the first is basic, the middle is standard, the top tier one is preferred. And then under dental, where you see 1,500, 3,000, and 5,000, that is kind of like the, um, the annual benefit amount. So they can pay for that just like they can with the school system. Um, again, that's something that we wouldn't be paying for. They would opt in to do that through ESS. And we have um, benefits guys that we can share with Dr. Oates if he wants to share with you all. We have, we have a stack of those for you as well. Some additional advantages for Rockdale. And um, one thing, well, I'll start on the right side. So from HR and the principal standpoint, if we're if someone else is helping us with the paraprofessionals, then we'll focus on the teacher vacancies and the hard to fill positions. The principals would maintain control. They still conduct candidate interviews and they have full autonomy. So if they're, they want to hire somebody, it's still the principal's choice. If it's time to separate with someone, that's still the principal's choice. But ESS will help us with that, that on in-district partner that we'll have. Um, ideally, if there's a slightly higher salary, that means more qualified candidates and less turnover. And then if we have people who are like, no, I really don't want to go through ESS. I'm planning to become a teacher. This is just the first step for me. Then there could be exceptions for that. So we could still hire people the regular way as a school system employee, but the goal would be to do the bulk of people who aren't necessarily staying on with us for years and years and becoming educators this way. Um, and then as Ms. Smith will talk about, significant savings of 10,000 plus per paraprofessional. Yes, as Dr. Oates was mentioning, we would be looking at this primarily from a budget savings um, standpoint. Um, so if you see that $20,000 parapro in the end could cost us $44,000. We've had significant increases in our health insurance, um, TRS, all of that. The cost to employ someone that takes state health and, and obviously we have to do the TRS exceeds their, can exceed their salary. And so that's why we consider this a, a good cost savings for us. We pay 44,000 ESS, we pay them 30,000 and our savings could be $13.7,000 from that one employee. Um, again, like I said, the reason why we would really consider this is we've had increasing employer costs. Um, our TRS has gone in the last five years from 19.06 to this coming year, it'll be 20.78%. State health um, has gone from $11,340,000 per year to next year, it'll be $17,420 per person for the year. That's a significant increase. In the last three years, we've seen a almost 54% increase in our state health benefit costs. Okay, so um, thank you all very much for your consideration. As Dr. Oates mentioned in the opening, if you have questions, if you'll please let them know, we'll research that for you and get your answers so that you can make an informed decision. Indeed, and let me let me thank you ladies for this. And let me just say again to the board and to our public, this is a directive that I uh, assigned to HR uh, and to our finance division because we have to have all things on the table as we're moving into our budget season. And again, I think it's not a stretch to talk about where, how we, if, if, if in fact it had been adopted previously, and this is not, not I, I respect the decision that was made, but, but I'm just saying at the point of making, we've been a better position now as we confront these increased uh, health uh, insurance costs. But um, I was talking to Dr. Jason Branch, who's the superintendent, uh, of Oconee County Schools and an old colleague of mine from 25 years ago when we were working in uh, Glenn County in Brunswick, Georgia. But he's one of the school districts 
who uh, actually use it, utilizes it for the paraprofessionals. And he talked to me. I just got back a couple hours ago from Savannah, attending the annual uh, Georgia School Superintendents Association's uh, um, uh, Spring Bootstrap Conference. And he was there and he was talking to me about how beneficial. He said, hey, I understand that you're at least going to consider. And he talked and shared more information. So again, this was an informational presentation. Would you do me a favor, ladies, and just introduce the individuals who are here who are with ESS they're they're not to yeah. they're not here to make any comments but they're going to be working through this process and if there's consensus on this they will be back joining these ladies to share and engage with you and answer questions Vice President of ESS and with her is Scott Smith he's the benefits guru for, for ESS as well. So right. they came to support us. Indeed. Today. So I'll ask the board members to direct any questions just on the that they that have arisen on the basis of this initial informational presentation. I will get those answered and get it back to the board and then I'll be working over the next a uh, few weeks to see if there's consensus for more information, right? For more information. We're not at an action item standpoint. We wouldn't be there before there was some sort of consensus if there is a consensus for looking into this. But again, really the reasons are not different on April the 11th, 2024 than they were in 2020 when I initially push, uh, had this to be looked at. It's for cost savings because benefits have been increasing consistently and as you said the benefits exceed the salary in terms of what we're on the hook for and uh so i thank you so much i appreciate both have a question do i understand you to say there's going to be another presentation or are we sending you questions and you're going to email those questions to us yes both both if you have initial questions that have been prompted I have questions. by yes that have been prompted about by the presentation yes Share those with me and I'll get them to you and get the answers back. But there will be future presentations, in-depth presentations where you can engage with the vendors and with our staff as well. Okay. And also small group board briefings. We can leverage that as well to have further conversation. But again, this is an informational presentation to prompt additional, if there are additional questions, all right? Mm -hmm. I think those questions should be asked and respond so that the public hears them because um, our paraprofessionals may have questions and they may need to hear some of the questions that we may have and they may also need to hear some of those responses. I recall this being an action item. I was not on the board then, but I remember being very concerned about it. Sure, and, and, th and what you have just articulated will happen. In fact, there's also, could you speak to the meetings that take place with paraprofessionals, which is part of the process? Yes, yeah, so traditionally with ESS, if they partner with the district, they have meetings, one meeting for people who are in the first five years of employment with the school district to kind of show them that option. Um, they haven't really focused on people who are past that because if you're well, well into TRS, it shouldn't, it wouldn't likely be something you're interested in. But for those people who are early in their careers, and then there could be ongoing meetings for the new hires as well. So there would be informational sessions for uh, Parapros who may be interested prior to entering yeah, an open in, meeting, right, right, right? Prior to making a choice, yeah. so they could have a Absolutely. some voice in that, know what they're choosing between. Exactly, and again, this is uh, this is in the interest of full transparency. This is an informational presentation to share with the board, and then I'm going to be engaging. I'm going to be doing my job and engaging with the board on uh, further questions that you may have and getting answers and then arranging future presentations that will be public as this initial informational presentation is. And so I'll certainly encourage those viewers to go back. That's the benefit of being live stream. We record these, archive them. You can go back and look, and then we're going to be having future discussion. But again, this will be driven by the degree to which there may be consensus in getting more information and then ultimately there would have to be a majority of the board that would wish to proceed or else we wouldn't be proceeding with this just as we didn't previously when uh, we shared this information but there was not a consensus. No, okay. que no question either but I do I do agree with Janie that even if we're not asking the questions up front where everybody's hearing us is that in your presentations and in your um you know, research on benefits and anything that we need to hear those questions that are asked in private Absolutely. answered in public. So it is um, 
like everybody's hearing the same answers, but it's not a long drawn out kind of meeting, right? That when we present, we do give the public all the information. Absolutely. The public and, and importantly yeah. paraprofessionals as well. Exactly. And so we would we would also send the, these answers and responses to the our paraprofessionals as well. So but thank I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Duly noted. Thank you all. Excellent. Thank, thank you, thank you. Very much. Mm -hmm. Madam Chairwoman, our distinguished Chief Operations Officer is coming forward with some items. Good evening. Madam Chair Brown, Vice Chair Duncan, Board Members, Superintendent Dr. Oates. I have two action items. The first one is the uh, facilities, cooling tower replacements at five of our schools. The superintendent will recommend that the Rockdale Board of Education approve Mechanical Services, Inc. as the contractor choice from bid submitted March 21st, an amount of $532,966 to replace five cooling towers. Those will be at Conyers Middle School, Edwards Middle School, Barksdale, Flat Shoals, Honey Creek Elementary School. So this contract is contingent upon the approval of the superintendent and general counsel. The reason behind this is our existing towers are over 25 years old, deteriorating quickly, operationally inefficient, and critically, critical replacement parts are becoming non-existent for us to get our hands on. So we've got to get moving on those this summer. The replacement scope of the work will include replacing the towers, pumps, heat exchangers, associated piping, and electrical com components. Those will come from East Blast 5. The second one we have is the boiler replacement at Heritage High School. The superintendent will recommend that the Rodney County Board of Education approve the selection of strictly mechanical as a contractor choice from bid submitted April 5th in the amount of $460,000 for the Heritage High School boiler replacement project. Uh, strictly mechanical provided the lowest bid for the project. The contract is continued upon the approval of the superintendent and general counsel. The scope of the project involves removal of uh, the current boiler, which we have shut off since we don't need heat these days, and the installation of a new boiler. The current boiler has exceeded its life expectancy and cannot be certified for continued safe operations. So they let us get by this winter and we've got to get some action on it now. This unit is vital and instrumental for the main heating functions of Heritage High School's main building site. $460,000 from East Bloss 5. And then just to share a few things with you that have been going on spring break. Obviously, we had an F2 tornado come through our community, unfortunately, and did a lot of damage for us. The damage was very minimal. We had some trees. That one's there by, is by my office. We lost several here, some smaller, rounds, smaller ones across the district. And unfortunately, this afternoon, as we sat down to dinner here, my fleet people called me, and we had a big pine tree at Tramp Station come down on two of our buses and Total one of them, probably the other one will be, let's we'll see how that goes. So with the continued rain and the wind this afternoon, that just happened. Dr. Oates, I didn't get a chance to even tell you before we walked in here tonight. So that just happened. Also a lot of spring break work with uh, ABM getting ourselves ahead for the summer. Summer school is slated to start uh, June the 3rd, I believe it is. And so as we go into summer school in June, it minimizes the time we have in the building to clean it. So we started some work during spring break. We have received six units of our DOE funded buses. This uh, We have eight of the last group that we got from the 2022 funding, and one of them is still in production. The other one is supposed to be on its way, but we're glad those are getting back in, uh, in service. We also constructed a training door for the Conyers Police Department equipment training. Uh, they funded that. We just helped uh, with the type of doors and the, and the construction that we have. And that is for our, our special training ops that we needed to have for our safety and for our kids and staff safety. We had some four projects that we've been working on, uh, tile and replacing carpets. We also did some window cleaning. So just some major work that really went on this last week and this, uh, this spring since we last shared with you. Uh, drain here at RCA to help with some flooding that has, has occurred at that building. And we're finishing that project up, uh, I think, next week. And that concludes my uh, presentation tonight. Do we have any questions? All right. Derek. Good evening, Good evening. Chairwoman Brown, uh, Vice Chair Duncan, Dr. Oates, board members. 
As we look to next year, uh, we prepare um, our, for our student laptops, uh, the refresh cycle for them. Uh, we have a three year refresh cycle. So next or this coming up year will be our high school. Uh, the following year will be middle school and then elementary, and then it'll continue that process. The student laptops are Dell laptops 3140s. Uh, these are rugged laptops meant for students. Um, they have a spill proof keyboard. Uh, they have a touch screen with Windows 11 on them um, and then they're fanless on the bottom so students can actually put them on their laps so they don't overheat on their laps as well. Um, so they're very nice laptops for our students. And so tonight uh, the superintendent will recommend the Rockdale Board of Education approve the purchase of 5,500 Dell laptop 3140 student laptops for $3,550,250 under state contract. This is the sustainment portion of our Learning or Imagine program um, for our students' uh, laptops. Now, financial impact will be from East Bloss 5. And that's all that I have. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Derek. And now we have our uh, financial report. Good evening again, Board Chair Brown, Vice Chair Duncan, Dr. Superintendent Dr. Oates, and the rest of the board members. Tonight, I present the preliminary financial reports for the month of March. Um, March revenues were $10.4 million. The year-to-date revenue was $168.9 million, representing 84.4% of the budget. Compared to last year, which was at also at $10.4 million for March, $152.6 million year-to-date, representing 84.3% of the budget. The expenditures this month were $17.3 million, $156.8 million year to date, representing 76.5% of the budget. The expenditures this time last year were $15.5 million for the month of March, $138.5 million year to date, representing 75% of the budget. The encumbrances for March were $1,212,190. Our fund balance, is $48,445,293. Last year this time, it was $52,761,396. Our assets are $54,636,815. Liabilities are $6,191,521. Again, our fund balance is $48,445,293. $245,293. That concludes the preliminary remarks. Okay, thank you. Any questions, board? Thank you, Justin. Madam Chairwoman, uh, if, if, if I can uh, ask for your indulgence, I do have some information that I'll share. Um, the, and initially it'll be just some announcements and information, but I'm happy to share uh, this message that Dr. Kirby Ming, our coordinator for fine arts, shared with me earlier. She said, good morning, I have good news. Rockdale County Public Schools has received the best communities for music education award. Uh, and uh, this is a national award that's issued by uh, uh, the NAM Foundation. And, it, and in fact, in the email, it listed all of the recipients nationwide. Uh, and of course, Cindy will has this information and will be disseminating it. So our board will be getting the press release as will our public, but this is great, great news. Uh, Dr. Ming has worked very closely with our uh, fine arts programs and she's worked diligently. Uh, and she's of course within the, all, within the teaching and learning division to really expand and bring additional resources to our fine arts program. And so I'm very, very pleased. And this is just one example of the fruits of, of, of the labor collectively of Dr. Ming and, and all of those music educators who work very closely with her. This is a very prestigious recognition and I wanted to share it. Additionally, I wanted to share that uh, while I was in Savannah today, I got the information that I'd been waiting for for some time which is our 2023 uh, cohort graduation rates for our four categories, right? That would be the advanced academic pathway completers, the CTAE pathway completers, the world language pathway completers, and the fine arts pathway completers. And I'm very happy to share that uh, in, in each of those 
graduation cohorts in those respective pathways, we saw increases over the 2022 graduation rates. And so let me share that with you. For our CTAE, which is our career pathways, right? And that would be students who graduate within four years who have completed at least one pathway. The 2022 percentages you've been hearing me share for a year now, which is our highest to date, is 99.13% is the graduation rate for, for 2022 uh, for our CTAE pathway completers. For 2023, now listen, it's difficult when you're that close to 100. It's not like you're going to see sweeping gains, but it's 99.36, right, is our 2023. And that's an increase, and we're proud of that. And um, and, and and sometimes people say, well, how do you get a 0.36 of a student? No, actually, when you're looking at the total number of students in the cohort versus those who complete pathways, you're going to end up with a percentages and fractions of percentages. And if you, depending on how you round it, we can round round it to 99, right? Or we could not round it to 99.4 if you're, depending on where you're rounding it. But uh, it, it does, so this is exciting to, to be increasing there. And all the other indicators that we did see in terms of pathway completion pointed to a nominal increase in our 2023 CTEA graduation rate. Let's go to fine arts. And I think that's relevant because I just mentioned this national award that came for 2022, our fine arts, uh, uh, graduation rate, four-year court graduation rate, those students who completed a fine arts pathway and, and graduated uh, was 96.25% graduation rate in 2022. Our current 2023, it's 98.05%. And that's a, that's a very sound improvement. And I think it's not a, a, it's not a coincidence that we're seeing these national recognitions that we're getting for our music education program as an example. And we're seeing the benefits of uh, coordination, constant coordination, and working to get additional resources to our fine arts programming. Let's move to world languages, right, which is very important. That's, a, that's it as part of our English language arts division. Dr. McRae uh, supervises that. Of course, for 2023, those students who completed a world language pathway, right, they completed that and they graduated. It was 98.82% was the graduation rate for 2022. For 2023, it's 99.27. So again, in all of them, we've seen increases. And I'll close with advanced academic pathway completers, Beth, right? <laughs> and Red Yada, right? All you guys. Now, listen, you heard all of the information uh, that they shared. And Ms. Gillespie as well, you heard all of this information they shared earlier about the progress we've made. Increased the gifted eligibility and student enrollment and, and gifted funding and increase in advanced placement and all of this stuff. And so 2022, the advanced academic pathway, those an advanced academic pathway means students have to take specific, very rigorous courses, advanced placement courses disproportionately at the high school level. And uh, and then you say how many? What percentage of those students graduate? Well, 99.48 percent graduated uh, in 2022. Now you know I said when you're that close to 100, you can't get you're not going you can't move that. Well, 2023, 100 percent of our students who completed the advanced academic pathway graduated. And let me share with you why this is important, because we are in Metro Risa right, which all the entire state in terms of our school systems are divided into regional educational service agencies. And we're Metro Risa, Metropolitan Atlanta Regional Educational Service Agency. There are 12 school districts that comprise Metro Risa. I don't typically do this, but I want for the benefit and information of our public, I want you to know those districts. Rockdale County, Atlanta Public Schools, Clayton County, Cobb County, DeKalb County, City Schools of Decatur, Marietta City Schools, Douglas County, Fulton County, Beaufort City Schools, Gwinnett County, and Forsyth County. I'm proud to share with you, looking specifically at the advanced academic pathway graduation rate, Rockdale stood alone with only one other Metro Risa school district, Beaufort City Schools, as having 100% graduation rate for our advanced academic pathway students. And that's very, very important because, listen, we are the second smallest county in the state of Georgia in terms of land mass, only behind Clark County, Athens Clark. But we're competing with some really big districts. I was a high school assistant principal in Gwinnett County 20 years ago, and there were 140,000 students then. 
There are over 180,000 students today. Uh, just as an example, 100,000 students in the cabin. Listen, they all did very, very well, right? Uh, uh, but I think that's a point of pride because I want to help us make connections between the work that's being done on the ground and the results that we're seeing in er each of those four uh, graduation cohort graduation rates, pathway rates, fine arts, world languages, advanced academics, and CTAE, we've steadily increased over the last four years. And I'm very, very proud of that. I want to thank all of the, thank you ladies for all the work you do. But as you said earlier, this is about the teachers on the ground working. They're going and getting the training, extra training they need to really deliver rigorous curricular curriculum to these students. And we're seeing the results. So if, if, if we might, Madam Chairman, I think that warrants applause. Don't yes. you think? And then we don't want to forget about these parents that's trying to help. Absolutely. The parents that the parents are critical because they advocate for their kids, but they also advocate for others, other people's children as well. Now, I do want to close if 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 you'll tee it up for me, Derek. And this is interesting because we did have uh, I believe that uh, uh, we had someone who talked about an audit. I believe it was Mr. Cox who shared about the audit. And so this is information that we've been having internally as a board as well. And uh, I thought it would be appropriate for me to devote a portion of my remarks to uh, uh, enlightening our public about our financial audit procedures and protocols. So if you'll go to the next slide, please, Derek. And uh, Heather, I know it's been two years that I've been getting my glasses and I haven't gotten them yet, but I may need some help. No, that's worse. God, that's worse. Okay, <laughs> so let me explain. Every year we have a comprehensive audit by our auditor Malden and Jenkins, uh, and it is a comprehensive audit and they look at local, state, federal, and even East Bloss funding. And um, Malden and Jenkins, you know this because it was just February when uh, Hope Pendergrass presented to our entire board. And, and the re let me say this, there is no requirement that there be a presentation on our audit findings. But I have, con and I'm not suggesting that this wasn't the practice uh, prior to my tenure, because it probably was. But I do want to share that Keith would always ask, do you, I'm like, yes, I want a public presentation of our audit findings every year. And again, that predated my tenure. I want to be clear about that. Um, but um, uh, she shared in February our audit, and she also dis gave, uh, disseminated the full audit report at the time to our board members, we have for, because listen, you don't keep all of this document. We share, we gave a, that audit, a full audit to each of our board members again. And it's an outside, it's an external audit, Malden and Jenkins. And I know a, a, a former chairwoman North could talk about Malden and Jenkins even more uh, from a more incisive perspective as a CPA herself, but they are the gold star for auditing firms uh, in the state of Georgia. And you can see that by, by looking at the number of, of school districts they're responsible for. And uh, they do that audit annually, and then they come and present that audit. Now, let's go further. You heard me say that Malden and Jenkins is comprehensive in their auditing, and they also include East Bloss, but we also have a separate auditor for our East Bloss funding, which of course is the funding that the citizens of the county have affirmed for us. Recently, they did uh, last month. Uh, and uh, we're grateful for that as we were in, in 2018 when they affirmed East Plus 5. But we have a separate auditor, it's SME CPAs who conduct our East Plus audits. And uh, they, they, of course, uh, that is something that we share that information. Let me just tell you, excellent report, both with respect to our Malden and Jenkins annual comprehensive financial audit, but also for our two fiscal year 23 uh, East Bloss audit, we got a, a very excellent report, no findings. And then let me share this with you because I share this information because the general public may not be familiar. We won't assume that they're familiar with our auditing, our rigorous and extensive auditing, auditing procedures and protocols. The, in addition to that, there is a, the financial services or financial review division at the Georgia Department of Education. It is a requirement that they receive every school district's financials from their annual audit and they review it with a fine tooth comb and they issue their own separate findings for our audit that has been done externally by an external auditor, in our case, Malden and Jenkins. They too do that annually and that's for all districts. It's not unique to Rockdale County in the state. 
and they gave us a no findings report, which is an excellent report. And um, uh, the next uh, annual audit is less than five months away. Uh, and uh, I will also tell you that, of course, we don't have audit audits are not free. They're not done free by these external auditors, right? And uh, you're talking about along the lines of forty-five to fifty thousand dollars, and we're we're just five months out from our next audit. Let me let me remind you of this as well. The audit can only take place after the fiscal year concludes, and the fiscal year concludes on June thirtieth of each year. The audit doesn't take place to the fall of the subsequent school year. And typically for us, that's in the month of September. Very extensive process. So why is it important for me to share that? Every year when we have an audit, right, our annual comprehensive audit by Malden and Jenkins, the, the money we use to pay for that audit is actually monies that are budgeted in the subsequent years, in the next year's uh, budget. And so that would be, so the fiscal year 23 audit was paid for out of fiscal year 24 funds, right? Uh, our next audit, which would take place in the fall in September of 24, will be paid for out of fiscal year 25 budgeted funds that we've not yet completed our FY25 budget, because as of today, we don't have our state numbers yet. And so uh, hopefully we'll be getting that. Uh, Joyce, any day now is Ronnie Millsap saying, let's hope so, okay? And um, so I, I wanted to share that information with you. And listen, I realize that there's a lot of information that's shared uh, and, and, and sometimes when you're trying to recover and remember all of this information, but the purpose here is to be transparent with our public about what our annual auditing procedures and protocols are, to let you uh, understand how extensive they are, to help you understand the external nature of these audits, right? And, uh, but I do want you to go to the next slide, if you would, please, um, Derek. And if you would, I want I want you to play this. This we have just excerpted this down to the five minute presentation by Hope Pendergrass, who is our who is a partner, by the way, with Malden and Jenkins, but also our auditor. Let's listen to this. And I ask for your indulgence, Madam Chairwoman. You know, often I will say I have no remarks, and that's more often than not. But I I think this is critically important. Let's roll the item, and we'll start with uh, a special guest uh, who will be sharing feedback on our recent audit. A former CFO is handing out the audit, the full audit. Uh, you see him in the in the video. Good evening. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you all. My name is Hope Pendergrass. I'm a partner with Malden and Jenkins CPAs. We're the um, accounting firm that does your annual audit. I think we've done it for eight or nine years now. Um, and I, Keith has passed out to you our auditors discussion and analysis. I'm not going to go through this whole document. I've just included it here for you. But we're just going to give a brief uh, a synopsis of the results of your FY23 audit, which was ended uh, 6-30-23. Um, when you think of your net position of your whole governmental entity, y'all were looking pretty strong at about $20 million. But part of that includes the fact that you all have to report a liability for your net pension plans and your net OPEB plans, which those plans are not 100% funded. So that liability is, is recorded. It's not something that you all are going to have to pay. You continue to make your contributions, whatever the state tells you. But that is contributions and that liability is reflected. And if it wasn't reflected, y'all would be at a positive net position of about 308 million. So that's a huge liability that they've kind of passed on. So we want to talk about the general fund because that's what you all are kind of used to seeing. Your general fund at the end of the year had fund balance of about 39.2 million. And when we talk about the general fund, the way we reported in the audit, we include all your federal programs in there too. So that's not just your fund 100. And that fund balance was very liquid. You had um, cash and investments that exceeded that amount. So it was very liquid at that time. But you also need to think about the fact that that is one of your leanest times of year. You think about June, you finish the year, you're getting ready to do fall taxes, all that kind of stuff that's coming in. So that's a lean time of year. That represented about um, eight weeks of fund balance. So you think about eight weeks is not a lot of reserves to think of. But again, that was just as of one day in time. Um, Y'all were right 
over about the 15% rule. The state of Georgia says you should have about 15% fund balance. When you look at that, you're thinking about your next year's expenditures. What are my total expenditures going to be? We need to have fund balance of about 15%. Y'all are right over that, so you're right in line with what the state expects. Um, and when you look at your budgeted numbers, y'all budgeted to um, dip into your fund balance some for the year, um, but you didn't dip into it as much as you anticipated that you would. So you had a positive variance on your budget of about 1.2 million. And I was looking at your FY24 numbers. I noticed that y'all have budgeted at least your original budget was to dip in about $5 million for FY24. And I know y'all will be revisiting that again once you um, get some of your final projections from the state after they do their mid-year adjustment. Um, another thing that we do as part of the audit is we look at your uh, federal programs. You all received or expended about $40 million in federal funds last year. That's your S or your Title I, your 6B funds, special ed funds, all of that. We don't look at all of them. We do a risk-based approach where we just do a few programs. And this year we looked at your school nutrition program, your ESSER program, and your Title VI B program. That represented about 29.7, not quite $30 million that we looked at, uh, or about 74%. And we had no findings at all. So it's very, it's very easy when you have all these federal regulations, especially with some of all this COVID funding, you know, they're kind of building the regulations as they were passing out the money. So I just want to congratulate the, the board, the superintendent and the finance team on the fact that, you know, y'all are dotting all the I's and crossing all hey, the T's and not everybody Derek, is doing please. that. So I think you should be very proud. Pause it, Derek, if you would, please. Uh, again, I think this is critically important. This is the February audit, right? Uh, we should all be very happy that we're actually looking at the audit so that we can see the actual information and we understand what our auditing processes are. But she said that we are dotting our I's and crossing our T's, and that's critically important. And I say that because I, I'm going to commend our staff when they are doing the job that we have, that we expect them to do. And, uh, and we have multi-layered auditing protocols our comprehensive annual Malden and Jenkins audit. And then we have our separate East Bloss auditor, SME CPAs. And then it is required as part of the Georgia Department of Education's protocols and procedures and requirements that they take each district's financials from their comprehensive audit and they do their own review of it and then issue a separate finding from the independent outside auditor. And, and then we always are committed to a public presentation of our audit every year. If you'll start back up, Derek, if you will. Of um, the results of, you know, our audit, um, we had an unmodified opinion. That's the best opinion you can get. And another Stop thing right is we had Derek, no audit. Would, please. This is important. Did you hear that? She said that's the, that was an unmodified piece and that is the highest that you can get. Listen, guys, again, I want people to be informed and to hear this. And this is critically important. That's the highest. And I'm, I'm not going to apologize for being proud of our financial services division for working hard. And I know that it's not just a one department thing. It's interdepartmental because you have to work with all of the departments who have uh, expenditures and budgeted items. But this is a point of pride. I'm, I'm just as proud of this as I am the fact that we got the National Music Educator Award and the fact that we've increased for the last four years on each of our core graduation rates right? I'm just as proud because this is more qualitative, right? In terms of the way we're handling our finances. So now for those of you who could will appreciate this, I'm going to let it play out without stopping it, but I'm just excited because I want to share the pertinent information there. So an audit adjustments <laughs> is when you all close the books, we come in and look at it and we might say, oh, this is not quite right. We need to adjust something before we present the financial information in the financial statements. We don't have any of that here. And this is one of the few places that we go that we don't have audit adjustments. I mean, we're all human. And so it's real easy for us to come in and say, oh, this isn't quite right, but we don't have that with you all. So again, I just want to congratulate the board, the superintendent and the finance team on what a great job that you all do. It makes our jobs really easy. So. Thank you. And with that, I'll be glad to entertain any questions. And that's always a Did part I say of what I was audit. supposed to, Keith. 
<laughs> <laughs> Always part of our audience. Do we have any questions? No questions posed at time. We did. Well, I would like to say G W O D J O B. Good job. Good job. We we can stop it there, Terry. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, listen, right, I mean, we'll... Madam Chairwoman, that's all I have for the superintendent's remarks. Well, all right then. A lot of good news to share. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Quantitative data. I said qualitative, but I meant quantitative when I was referring early. Heather shared that with me. I appreciate that. All right. We're moving right along. The cabinet has provided numerous presentations under information. I would like to ask our board members to please review that information. At this time, I know we've been here quite a while. Is there a need for a recess? All right, well, we'll move right along. Please review the March 2024 board meeting minutes and provide any edits to Ingrid. We will vote on the minutes in the regular session next week. There is no old business and there is no new business. The cabinet has provided an overview of action items for the board to vote on next week. Is there a motion for the action items to be placed on a consent agenda? I'm Consent agenda. Consent agenda. All right, a motion has been made by Vice Chair Heather Duncan to place those uh, items in a consent agenda and it has been seconded by Mandy North. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. All right, at this time, <clears throat> excuse me, at this time, I would like to open the floor for a board discussion on this prospect of a mid-year financial audit, a concern that was brought up by board member Kenny. Um, I, I now open the floor for board members to discuss this topic, starting with Mr. Kenny. Thank you very much. Uh, my call for this audit has to do with the recent loss of our longtime CFO. It is customary practice in the private sector and the public sector that when a chief financial officer resigns or is fired that there is an audit to ensure that the books are are on board that the finances are in order for the next incoming financial officer uh, i think it's imperative that whoever is next whether it's miss smith or there is another hire that there is a comprehensive audit i'm going to disagree with something that the superintendent said that the annual audit that we get from Auden and Jenkins is comprehensive as, um, I can't remember the lady's name, but as she said, they did not do an exhaustive or comprehensive audit of our budget. They picked certain components of our budget of government programs that, you know, when the, the federal funding, she said it was about 75%. Yes, that's a big chunk, but it's not exhaustive. Uh, we need to ensure that, you know, when our financial office, our chief financial officer leaves that the public has confidence that he did not do so because of financial irregularities. And the statement was made that he retired. Well, he didn't truly retire. He left Rockdale County Public Schools to go to Walton. From an optical standpoint, that's a bad look to the citizens of Rockdale County who know Keith Hall. There are concerns in the public that there are financial issues within Rockdale County Public Schools that would be uncovered with an audit. I think we owe that to them. If it's going to cost, you know, ten thousand dollars more, twenty thousand dollars more, as you know, to get that comprehensive audit in conjunction with the annual audit, I think we need to find the money. There, there have been what the public foresees is frivolity spending in Rockdale County Public Schools with the addition of a new vehicle for the superintendent. Um, I, you know, the board voted for it, but if we can afford a new vehicle, we can afford a comprehensive audit to ensure that our books are in fact on board and we can give the public confidence thereof. So that's my reason for a call for a comprehensive audit. Madam Chairwoman, if I might, just because I think it's critically important that that we convey accurate information. Uh, former CFO Keith Hole retired from Rockdale County Public Schools, and um, and it was not abrupt. 
and, and it was not abrupt. Um, our normal HR no, uh, reporting protocols are are in place for any retirement. I actually emailed that information to the board, and also we engaged in another forum, not public forum, as is proper for personnel discussions, in which I shared even more important detail. It gets down to the nuance of different districts and different retirement systems, right? There are a number of people who retire from one system and they go and work in another system because it's a different retirement system and they draw their retirement income from the system they've left and they earn their new income from the. So it is factually incorrect that Mr. Hull did not retire. The other thing I, I would share is that uh, when you said that it's standard practice to have an audit when there when the uh, when there's a departure of a CFO before another one comes in. Well, we have an interim CFO who's been the director of financial services working right hand in glove with uh, with Mr. Hull, and she will serve in that role for the remainder of this current fiscal year. And then we will set about to look at in the new fiscal year, we'll lay out plans of action for recruiting for full time. And obviously she may apply if she wishes to, just like anyone else who may be interested in that vacancy. Um, and also, again, I and, and as the chief executive officer and the treasurer to the board, I think a, an audit at this point uh, before the conclusion of the of the fiscal year would be fiscally irresponsible uh, in terms of the cost. It would just be irresponsible because I shared that there are there are no funds currently budgeted for an audit because the audit occurs in the fall after the end of the fiscal year. And so it's paid for out of the new budget, which we've not yet uh, we've not yet developed. And so an audit now would would be on would be on funds that are not budgeted for. And again, the information that I shared in my remarks clearly shows that there are multiple layers of auditing. And the, and, and I know that Chairman North, uh, former Chairman North can mention that the process for auditing is where you take a piece of that's the protocol that's established. In fact, in her presentation, she cited the controlling authority for the way that you do audits. And so this would be fiscally irresponsible. It's not budgeted for. We're five months out from our next comprehensive Malden and Jenkins audit. And also after that audit, the Georgia Department of Education Financial Review Division will do its own independent review of our financials for Malden and Jenkins. And we have a separate auditor who will do our East Bloss funding. I also want to point out that I included and appended the letters uh, of findings in the PowerPoint presentation. Sometimes we get after meetings, open records requests. This information is, Derek, I do wish for this to be made accessible publicly to our public that they can go and grab it uh, uh, without having to make an open records request. We want to facilitate their access to that. But that's just my respectful response, uh, Justin. And my respectful response, if we're going to be factually accurate, I did not call for mid-year. I'd called for a comprehensive audit in conjunction with the one that's going to occur at the end of the year. And we can we can argue over semantics of the word abrupt, but when the board is told at least the first I'd heard that Mr. Holt was going to be retiring was an article in the Walton County Tribune, and I was told the next day as a board member that Mr. Holt was going to be retiring, and his last uh, his last report to the board was the following meeting, and then he retired March 31st. So by my definition of abrupt, I think it was abrupt. If you disagree, that is your respectful opinion, yeah. but given how the transfer of Mr. Hull out of Rockdale County to Walton County took place, think to instill public confidence. We take on the additional expenditure and get a comprehensive audit. At this time, we're going to take other comments from other board members. If any other board members want to make any comments, please do so. I Sandra like jackson -Lett. Yes. Absolutely. We're going to come down the line. Okay. Sandra jackson -Lett. with the normal audit. What situation? Hmm? I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Can you speak up just a moment? Well, my throat is bothering me. Oh, okay. Do, do you want to say it so everybody can hear you? What I said was I agree with Justin and everything that he said. And everything he said, okay. Duncan? Okay. Mandy, would you please step up? Um, Yes, as a CPA, probably the most qualified person on this board. This is a comprehensive audit. 
with 99, actually 100 pages that was left. What was given to the board was just a small sample of what they did. Any audit, if you're auditing a public firm, you have to follow generally accepted auditing standards, GAS. Yes. That's the acronym. Um, for governmental entities, there's governmental audit standards. They're not something from Georgia. They're not something from Alden and Jenkins. There's something from the United States government. And you can look at the auditor's report, the first four pages that clearly says they conducted their audit in accordance with the auditing standards generally accepted in the United States of America and the standards applicable to all financial audits contained in government auditing standards issued by the Comptroller General of the United States. All of these follow the same thing. There is no way you can look at every single transaction, every check, everything every time you pull a sample and it has to be a reflective sample you cannot audit everything you have standards to follow that's exactly what they've done they don't just audit us as rockdale county there are tons of other uh, i don't remember but in what was given to the board there was a um, chart of all the other schools that they also audit i um, remember interviewing with malden all malden jenkins when i was getting out of college so i know this firm has been around for years i'm not sure exactly when the firm started but it's been around at least 35 years i totally value their opinions and i know um i have not read 100 pages of this but i know should you guys read it that you feel like it you're asking for a comprehensive audit that's exactly what we have that's exactly what will occur again after the end of this school year on our books that close on june 30th of this school year and it takes a while to do the audit. That's why we don't get the reports and the presentation to the board until February. Um, the management letter on this is dated December 22nd, 2023. So it's not of my opinion to have another audit because we're gonna do it. It's the same thing. It's just a waste of money when there's no findings. Now I agree that we have our work to do because we're going to have to really look at our budget, but they don't audit budgets. They audit your financials, how you have coded your transactions. Now, yes, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of mandated increases in our health insurance costs, but I would say there's no one here other than me that understands our financials that's on this board and how budgeting works, how financials work, how audits work. I would not agree to pay for another exhaustive audit when that's exactly what we have and we have another one and we've had no findings. It's been a clear audit. We've been praised for our financial work. I have had relationships with our previous CFO prior to Keith and with Keith and I know he did an outstanding job. I value the work he did. He was transparent unlike what we had had previously. He was transparent. He showed us and told us everything, his concerns. I have spoken with Keith since he took the other position as well. It was win-win for him. I can't blame him for that, but I have no concerns that he's leaving because we have some financial something no hidden to. to look at. That's my opinion. That's me as a CPA, and that's my professional opinion. Thank you, Ms. North. Heather? I wanted Mandy to go first because while I don't do um, audits on that level, I do audit for, um, I was trained by William Mann who has passed away now and I have done it for DeKalb County, Rockdale County and um, Newton County under the guise of my position as Assistant District Director for, um, for the Georgia PCA, one of the oldest advocacy groups in the world, right? And um, like you said, Mandy, 100 page report it is comprehensive we ask hope to give us a, um, a summary of what it says she has explained to us the processes she has explained to us that she dots her i's cross her t's and that she commends us for doing the same we have a reputable company organization that's taking care of it and there is no need for an audit when we have until June 30th in two months to turn our books over. And that's just my take. Thank you. Ms. Palmer. Um, I absolutely agree with the uh, assessment of Mandy. I am an auditor as well um, in my profession. 
I do not see a need to have an audit at this time. I know we have one coming up. I do not see anything in the findings. They have already clarified that it is a clean audit. Um, Justin, we do sample auditing, even at the state level, we do samples. We do not look at every single document. So I do not support an audit at this time. I will wait for the audit that is scheduled to occur at the end of the school year. Ms. Jones. Yeah, so what I hear Justin say is, a, an additional and another audit would provide additional legitimacy that there are no concerns. There's no reason for us to be concerned for those who are concerned with our district's um, um, budgets or our district's um, finances. I didn't mean budget, I meant finances. And what I, I'm going to repeat it again. What I hear Justin say is that an additional um, audit would only add another layer of security with saying there is nothing wrong. I get it. So so I just want to clarify when you say additional audit, are you talking about a new audit with a separate company or you uh, please explain because I, I just want to make sure I understand what the request is. I think that would when we look at that first company, if that company had provided audits for like that kind of for what eight years. I mean, yes, I I don't see and I think it would be um, best to have it done by a different company instead of the same company that has done it year after year. I think so. Only thing he's saying is that right now I'm he's feeling a little bit iffy about um, about the with the about the district's finances um, losing key. That's all he's saying. Let's make sure before the next person takes over, there are no issues or there are no concerns. That's what I hear, and I agree with Justin. And before another CFO is named full-time CFO, there will be an audit, right. and it will be our audit of fiscal year 24. So at this time, will we take a vote? Or? <laughs> okay, so. Um, okay, so no, I don't have anything to say. All right, so um, I would like to um, <clears throat> move forward. Um, do I hear a motion to conclude the um, meeting? So moved. Nobody, nobody made a motion. So why don't I make a motion for what I'm gonna do for that? Nobody made the motion. So I'm moving forward. So if you're gonna make a motion, make one. At this time, there is no motion. I motion that we conclude the meeting. 7.51 p.m. Okay. I'm, about to, I'm about to do that. Motion has been made by Heather Duncan, second by M Mandy North. All in favor? Motion carries. 7.51, the meeting is over.